Oh, great. Yeah, I'm so happy that you can hear me. Uh, seems to have been an issue on my side. So I just, I just go ahead, I, I, I go on screen share and uh, give you my 20 minutes presentation, if that's all right. So you should be able to see that. Is that okay? Finally. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks for inviting me and being able to speak about um, projects we did at, at uh, the institute that I work at, which is the Fraunhofer Institute for Applied Information Technology uh, in um, St. Augustine near Bonn in Germany. I'm uh, Leif Oppermann, I'm the, the group head of the Mixed and Augmented Reality team uh, in there. And uh, we had a, a series of, of, of projects that I want to talk about most um, dominantly about the Arif project, which was the, the, the bigger follow-up project, but there was also a seminal project that I, I briefly want to touch. Um, so yeah, this, this work has been previously presented at the Mobile HCI uh, conference in uh, 2016 in Florence, when we were all still traveling, got fond memories uh, of the project and of the conference. And, and so here we go. Um, click on a link. Uh, I would like to start with a, a quick video so you get a, a, an impression. I hope it streams well. My, my internet should be fast enough, but well, we had lots of problems, so let's see how it goes. Okay, so much for the video. I hope that came across uh, well. Um, so, of course, there's uh, uh, related work. There's a few pictures here for us. It started with uh, architectural visualization and, and stage planning. You can see an early prototype here on, on, the, on the top left. Um, on the middle right, we've got um, a screenshot from a pervasive gaming project that I was uh, working on as a PhD student. Um, I did my PhD at the Mixed Reality Lab in Nottingham, I think I, I didn't mention that, so we were in, in pervasive gaming and, and, and things like that. Um, so, um, 
in, in this domain that we are talking about, um, the related work that, that uh, was relevant uh, from our perspective was, um, for example, the, the 1993 wet PC, which uh, was the first underwater PC that, that we found without tracking, without augmented reality, just an underwater PC almost 30 years ago now. Then uh, we had the virtual old scenarium in, in Lisbon in Portugal 20 years ago, which was a, a very large simulated underwater world. Uh, well, that you can explore virtually. And a couple of other systems like the Sea Slate and, and the Triton, which um, uh, was quite prominent back then, and I think is still around. Um, but they had no mobility support and they had no AR. So they were basically monitors on, on swimming pool walls. And so um, from there, my, my colleague Lisa and, and some other colleagues started working on the underwater AR system, which was uh, mobile and uh, included tracking. Um, more related work first. Um, so um, tracking objects in a pool is uh, a repeatedly found task. So you have to, Simon Shelley with cleaning robots and other people with sonar and optical tracking, just for example. Then for the uh, human computer interaction, you got um, Lisa, that's, that's Bloom et al. with the underwater AR game. You've got uh, Pell and Müller from Australia with their artistic installation. Uh, I think Floyd is giving a talk later today, I saw from the program. Then you got Van Lucas uh, to improve uh, uh, ROV navigation, and you've got Rafi introducing interaction categories across uh, six degrees of water contact, which I think is quite interesting. So yeah, first prototype in a mask uh, by FIT, uh, well, 13 years ago, wow, time flies by. Um, so the, the tangible aspects of, of the water changed the, uh, the perception of, of the users. And um, we think it also, the, the prototype challenged the underlying assumption what AR could be or actually is. Um, so it was a game with uh, fish and treasures, treasures and it was uh, originally a student work, so very good uh, final work of, of, uh, of a student and it got worldwide attention. Um, so all the dive magazines in the world kind of featured it. Um, it got uh, Lisa uh, a third prize at the Seagraph 2009 student competition and it was also featured on Canadian uh, Discovery Channel. And I think uh, if that hopefully works, uh, it worked just before the conference, I'll give it a go here. Just a minute or so. I think that should do for the introduction. If you want a full video, you can check it on the, on the YouTube channel uh, or just search for augmented reality underwater or write me in mail. Um, right. So that was uh, the prior work. And then we got the Arif project, um, uh, which tried to put it into pool and into children's hands. So the, the first prototype was a bit clunky and, and fragile and also very expensive. So we tried to, uh, to make it all a bit more low cost and also while, while making safe, which relates to what uh, Bob was talking about earlier. So yeah, Augmented Reality for Water-Based Entertainment, Education and Fun, that was the full title for our uh, PANI acronym. 
and we wanted to develop underwater AR experiences that you could deploy in water parks or swimming pools. Uh, it's a project from 2010, just December really, so 21 years ago, um, and, and running for three years. Uh, led by us back then with participant SME corporations in Germany and in Korea, and also subcontract in, in Korea, so two partners on, on each side. We were funded by the Korea Institute for Advancement of Technology, or short the KIAT, and we were the first KIAT funded project with the European lead organization, which gave us some kind of uh, press also uh, back in the day. Um, yeah, our mission statement from when we started, we thought that water is uh, really a fascinating medium and we wanted to develop fascinating underwater AI experiences. And when we looked back and at, at prior work in the field of augmented reality, uh, which I've also been doing for 20 years now or back then for, for 10 years, basically everything had been staged in the medium air. And so uh, that was all new territory, era in cognitive, if you if you wish. So we wanted to bring computer games and entertainment applications from, from the desktop or your mobile device to mobile underwater using AR technology. And we wanted to pioneer that. Uh, just a brief overview of our system. So uh, as you've seen in the video, it's, it's basically a tablet that was a, at first a Galaxy tab and then a Nexus 10 built into a, a waterproof case. We'll have pictures of that in a bit. And other than that, that was, of course, the standard Android operating system uh, with the Unity 3D engine on that and with uh, tracking and also, of course, content. So just a, a quick look at the engineering bits. So in, in year one, that's the top picture on the right, we had a metal case with 26 bolts, which was very robust. Uh, we had touch improvements because, well, it was watertight, so you couldn't reach the touch screen, but the, the project partner, Umtech, um, filed for, for a patent after they found a solution to, to make uh, the touch possible on this. And it was a single player game. Um, it worked um, and we had to rework it in, in year two, so we could go farther. Um, first improvement was to make the case uh, a lot more lightweight and uh, so and, um, that was reached with the introduction of a lot more plastic, uh, which also finally gave a better Wi-Fi reception. And uh, it was less than half the weight than in, in year one. Uh, it probably still uh, cracked the floor tile if you dropped it to the floor, but anyway, that was uh, waterproof. Then in, in year three, uh, we refined the, the locking mechanism to make it easier to use, like a suitcase really. And uh, yeah, we, we changed uh, dimensions for the, for the final hardware. In the first two years, it was the Galaxy Tab. And then for the final year, it was the, uh, the Nexus. And we produced a multiple of these units uh, for our user testing. And we also uh, made a prototype for wireless charging because that was deemed important by the water park experts that we talked to. Uh, just a quick overview of what the experience would look like. You've seen it in the video already, but there's basically uh, several kits in a pool at different underwater locations uh, marked by metal plates. They would have little islands where they could interact while hovering or swimming above that island. And you would basically go on, on little mini quests that you would receive from the out of the water uh, base station. And you would also have to take your results back to there. Yeah. As I already said, you, you move around, you explore the virtual underwater scenery and you score at the base station. Uh, the, the background for this kind of designs was, was manifold and, and not the least to Wi-Fi not spreading really well underwater. So we had to find a, a, a seamful way of playing with, uh, with the Wi-Fi signal re reception really. Um, yeah, just a, a quick overview of, of, of the assets. So you've got the envisioned setup at the top. And in the middle, you see the actual setup, uh, actually quite a nice shot. Um, I was really pleased when we had that, that it, it worked out like that. Uh, the base station is just a, a, a low-cost waterproofed uh, Nexus 10 tablet and, and a big marker. And then we've got uh, three uh, alu bond markers also that we, we sunk in the water. They were usually like a meter wide. And on, on the top uh, right, on the bottom right, you see an, an example island. Yeah. For example, there's, there's a little lobster over here. Yeah, more screenshots, I'll just skip those. Um, 
more screenshots. So yeah, we, we wanted to evaluate that. So we wanted to uh, find out uh, if it <laughs> was actually fun and uh, also if it would allow players to uh, safely finish the game with a sense of satisfaction, it's a more, more researchy uh, way of, of saying it was okay and fun. And we wanted to find potential problems and challenges that we would have to address in future versions or maybe others could address in future versions. And so um, what we did was a user-centered evaluation. We, we tested the game in a realistic environment, i.e. In, in a pool with kids. And we collected feedback for the game under as, as real conditions as we could. And children were of 7 to 12 years old. Uh, we used a mixed method approach using qualitative and quantitative evidence. Uh, which required uh, quite some manpower, up to five researchers at the time. Um, we also locked some events on the device itself, and uh, I think there's a slide on it uh, in, in a bit. Uh, we basically had a one-hour time slot for three children, so we would welcome them, introduce them to everything. The parents would be around, of course, and we would play the game, interview them, and they would get a little present at the end. Uh, chronology was we first did a pilot evaluation in Darmstadt, Germany with three children, then we would um, campaign to organize more players. Of course, we found that it's easier to do a campaign that people want to participate in than to ask people if they can send their kids over, which is usually not very well received. And we got a, a lot of uh, feedback from, from that campaign and many people wanted to participate with the children. And we got 36 um, players during that week-long campaign. Yeah. Pictures from the, the test players uh, at the pilot in Darmstadt. And so we, we tested the overall procedure of everything, including our evaluation methodology. And we wanted to establish a routine in the team. And we only had very minor refinements to do after the, the pilot test, which was uh, one of the tasks was too complicated. There's, there's a little game where you could clean the underwater world. From, from some trash, and um, that was made a little bit easier. And we also just um, put the marker distance right. Then we went to Sigburg uh, swimming pool, and uh, yeah, I already talked about the, the details of, of the demographics. The pool area was about uh, eight by eight meters and about a meter in, in depth. And so, yeah, find out if, if they played it well, if it was fun and if it was fit for the market. So that was what we tried to find out. Um, I, yeah, that's what I mentioned as this slide about the mixed method approach. So we got the device logging, we've got uh, video cameras uh, over water and underwater. You can see my colleague uh, Andy on, on the lower left. We got observers uh, taking notes by hand and we got questionnaires, little mini interviews that we, we did with the kids. Not very long, but um, just to get some some evidence. So, results. Um, yeah, uh, it was uh, perceived as very novel, not a big surprise, but children had not seen anything like this before. We thought maybe in the games they would find something similar, but they haven't. Uh, tracking worked. We um, we did some some basic tracking tests uh, with, with custom-made tracking. Our group uh, did custom tracking code in the past, and we also know how to use OpenCV, so we, we tried to find uh, ways of improving stuff underwater, but uh, even in the project, like in 2011 or 2012, we already opted to go with the standard library, which was Euphoria back in the day, and we had no real issues with that. So we could um, just say that even 10 years ago, it was okay to just take a, a, tr a standard tracking library underwater, and you would have no real issues. We found that you would want to, uh, to keep the challenges simple, so uh, children could uh, have some fun and wouldn't be too confused and also wouldn't be frustrated. So, for example, the cleaning trash was still a bit too complicated for some children, which caused frustration. And, and you don't want that if you just pay for something, probably. So, and you want to be very obvious. If something is not clear, it will cause confusion again. Also on the interface level, so we used uh, touch input only for text entry and then if you wanted to point at something you would aim it so it was a little crosshair in the middle of the display uh, still children try to touch on things because of course that's what they know that's what you do with these tablets and smartphones 
So yeah, make it make very obvious how you want to have the interaction. Uh, market distance for us worked fine with about 60 to centimeter uh, diameter on the on the short side for for the market size. Yeah, and it's related to the to the water gaps. So if our water was a meter deep, you would have this kind of diameter. If it was deeper, it would be bigger, obviously. Um, smaller kids, of course, play in shallower water. Uh, you have to provide for that. If your markers are too big, maybe it's not so fun because they don't have the overview. Maybe it doesn't even work. So maybe make some smaller markers. Uh, we found that water current uh, is an issue in the pool. It's, it's actually not surprising, but sometimes you rediscover things that you could have known before. So of course, there's fountains and vents, and they provide a flow of water. Not a big issue for a grown-up like us, but um, Small children might, you know, just flow away, and <laughs> we've seen that, so um, they were a bit frustrated by that. And uh, you might not be able to turn it off because it's not just you in the pool, and it might just be necessary for some other area um, very nearby. So you have to keep that in mind. Yeah, we 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 locked uh, data and uh, adjacent files, so um, the start and the end of the mission and every task that you completed or mastered and on which island you were looking at. And then we, we turned that into graphics that um, are now coming up just very quickly. So here you see an example session of, of three kids, Paul 1, Paul 2 and, and Keenan. And you could see on, on which markers they were, the, the light, uh, the middle and the dark blue are different markers that they had aimed. And then you could see uh, how long they played for. So uh, Paul 2 was the fastest. But that's not necessarily the goal of the game. I mean, if, if you have a good game, maybe you want to play it longer. Just, you know, and, and then for the different events, you could um, see it when they found different fishes and so forth. And, and having this graphic allowed us to, to really unpack what uh, happened in the game for, for each of the kids um, as part of the evaluation. If you are interested in the details, you can uh, always uh, read up at our, our our mobile HCI paper, playing on a reef, uh, just like the name of this um, talk. Um, so yeah, speed uh, is is an issue. Um, we can see that uh, in in this graphics, uh, Paul one was a lot faster than uh, Paul two, um, and uh, yeah, he lost some some tracking and and caught air once. And okay. Um, as clarity, you can you can see from the graphics that uh, Paul One was a bit confused by the second uh, mission, uh, which was uh, the cleaning mission where you had to uh, push trash over the edge of the island, and he tried again and again and again, and so that's the the long blue bit uh, bar at the at the bot uh, at the bottom of the top, and of course briefing is an issue um, if. Uh, well, if somebody has continuous tracking of two minutes, it's probably not because he held his breaths for so long. It's more like he had uh, his head above the water. So that's an interaction you will see. It's not like people will always dive or, or flow in the water. Maybe they just stand and have the head above the water, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, Test user Fabian uh, really enjoyed the graphics. So he stated in the interview that he, he just explored the world and he stayed longer because he liked it and that was, was good. Um, <laughs> uh, you, you know, maybe you get frustrated with some things, but maybe you're also very persistent. So we have uh, Marcus here, uh, which, uh, who only caught his first fish after 73 attempts. So that's, that's dedication. <laughs> Uh, he thought it could be improved though, but uh, for him it was part of the game and then he tried it so many times, that was amazing. Um, yeah, general feedback, um, as kind of was to be expected after everything worked out, I'm always very nervous when uh, evaluation starts, but you soon get a feel if, if it works out or not. And we got um, overwhelmingly positive feedback. Um, so, um, uh, children really like to catch fish. That was their favorite bit. Uh, cleaning trash wasn't so well received. And the treasure box also wasn't so well received. It wasn't so much fun. But catching fish was, was really good. Um, they like the Arif system. You can see that on the diagrams. And, uh, you know, some of them would, would rent it. Well, 35 out of 36 would say they would rent it and ask their parents maybe to, to get some money. 
the um, the difficulty was about right. Some things were too complicated. Some were too easy, but but generally was okay. Uh, so some discussion about the waterproof case. Uh, ours was still slightly too heavy after the third iteration, uh, and uh, maybe make it floating on the water surface was some some uh, thoughts we had. But generally, it worked. Uh, handling was okay. Not not uh, all super fantastic, but but okay. Um, so um, kids liked it, that was good. The, the swimming pool director liked it, and also the TV, TV report was, was quite positive. Um, we, we learned that uh, swimming pool installation needs to consider water taps uh, and, and water fountains, as already mentioned, uh, for future wishes, just from our evaluation, and, and again, more details on the paper. More virtual scenery. Uh, longer playtime, maybe even. I mean, we had 20 minutes, but they would have liked to play maybe half an hour or up to 90 minutes. Someone said you could have other themes and 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 again smaller, lighter case uh, recurring issue. I think especially from the smaller kids. Um, uh, here's an anecdote from from a father uh, who spoke to me, uh, watching his son uh, playing well underwater, and he was usually afraid of being underwater. He said. But uh, not so with the gain. So he was 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 the father was really happy that the son uh, happily dove underwater and and uh, just didn't think about his anxiety while while doing this. And so the father was uh, clearly very pleased about that. And and maybe the game had to uh, mitigate the anxiety. I, I think it did. So maybe that could be an aspect that can be designed for in VR, AR, XR, whatever. Yeah, upshot. Um, you can do underwater AR apps for sure. I mean, you, you can do underwater VR. We we all seen that already. I mean, we, we had the feedback from discussions we did with expert interviews back in the day. And also when we uh, tried to sell this, um, people want to put it on, on slides and, and put on masks and so forth. And, and throughput is an issue and stuff like that. But if you want to go underwater AR and, and not put it in the mask like we did in the first prototype, but make it safer for kids to use, uh, standard tracking is good enough. Um, the scenic content was very much appreciated. And, and, and this is also where most of the work is. I mean, one of our four partners, us included, one of the partners was a content expert. They were just doing 3D animations and games all day long. So that's what we're, what we're really good at. And I think that's where you see that the current companies that are selling VR experiences in this domain uh, have their emphasis. They are really good at making contact. The the content, the the engineering is is not so difficult anymore. Um, so yeah, waterproofness that's of course an issue. Um, but just having a waterproof device alone isn't enough. Even if it's the latest iPhone <laughs> back then, it was the the seven. Uh, we are we are farther now. Uh, we also tested it with the Sony Xperia Tablet Z, which was a, a brand new waterproof um, tablet back in the day. And we, we took it to pool, we, we spoke with Sony, and, and, and it worked. I mean, um, but you wouldn't have to touch because the water would be touching uh, the capacitive uh, screen all the time. So you would have random presses everywhere. So maybe the case wasn't such a bad idea. Or maybe not using touch. Yeah. And if you put it in a case, you should allow for wireless charging because um, otherwise it's, it's so much of a nuisance. I mean, we... We lost uh, our backup case in, in the first time slot of the first day and I, <laughs> because I didn't correctly close the case, I guess. And then one of the poor children had a, a tablet go bust uh, a few minutes uh, into the game. And uh, well, it was my problem, uh, but we had a backup device. But uh, the rest of the week, we didn't have one. And uh, we were extra careful to, to uh, close the case properly with a lot of uh, Vaseline and stuff. Yeah. So children and pool operators like this kind of stuff. Uh, missions uh, should be simple and clean, uh, clear, and, and physical movement in a pool is, is not, a, not a problem. So maybe this could be a model for spicing up old pools, just like uh, uh, the VR coaster now is, is a model for spicing up old roller coasters. So that's what we thought, yeah. Uh, finally, after the project ended, we were uh, also invited to Game City Festival in, in Nottingham, which was a big UK entertainment festival it was uh, a lot of fun to be there uh, really great and yeah it was also on, on, on television and we were invited I almost met the, the Korean president back in the day because they set up a science fair and we were all invited 
but German politicians took too much time, so she couldn't visit the science fair. But anyway, almost. So that's that's me and uh, the Arif project and the underwater project. And um, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take them. <laughs>